that uh, I would like to um, do that. Um, and then I'll be looking at some of um, other human coronaviruses and can we learn from them? And then I'll finish off with what we do know, details of publications of persistence and recurrence of PCRs as well as reinfections as they are known at the moment. And then some guidelines and some ideas of where the data will become available. Um, and then I can meet with you again in six months when we know a bit more. So the human coronaviruses, um, these four are the ones that um, have been um, circulating and cause upper respiratory tract infections every year in all age groups, and we know them well. Um, the two that cause lower respiratory tract infections, so SARS, CoV, and I'm going to talk about CoV-1 just so that I'm not mistaken, CoV-2 versus um, CoV, um, just CoV. But this SARS um, uh, virus and the MERS um, CoV virus cause more low respiratory tract infections and were quite limited. Um, SARS by time as well as by place, although it's spread a bit more widely. Then MERS, MERS is more localized, um, but has been ongoing. Um, and there've been cases um, occurring, um, sort of trickling in over time. So here's SARS-CoV-2 and how does the data and information that we know about these other coronaviruses help us in understanding SARS-CoV-2. So here, just to show you some of the, the interconnectedness from a genomic point of view of these human coronaviruses, SARS-CoV-1 is here. This figure and these, um, this publication was before 2020, so before we knew about SARS-CoV-2. This is where SARS-CoV-2 is most, um, most aligned, as they've discussed um, previously, is in this bubble here. Well, um, MERS-CoV is here is distinct, and here are the other four coronaviruses. And just to highlight that they are genomically distinct, but they're also distinct in the way they cause disease, the receptors that they use, um, the pathogenesis of the disease. Um, but as much as they are different, um, there are some similarities that I think we can definitely learn from looking at the other coronaviruses to understand what is happening um, in the current um, outbreak. So this is now SARS-CoV-2, our 2020 virus. And on the right-hand side, you see the, the genome. And I'm sorry, I'm going to cover the genome um, for you just a little because it, it's important from a reinfection point of view from almost three, there may be more reasons. But one reason is if the genome were to change a lot, as for example, influenza changes over time, then we would expect reinfections, maybe not immediately, not within the season, but we would expect them to come and um, every year and at other times. So it's very important to consider um, what the genome, the SARS-CoV genome and how much it's changing over time. It's also important to consider it as a result of the, um, the PCR target. So, our common PCRs that we're using in the laboratories that would be doing the diagnosis for you, they, they detect um, genome, the, the gene targets of RDRP, for example, or um, the structural protein genes of spike, um, the envelope, and the nuclear capsid. So these are the targets of the PCRs that we use. And if they were to change over time, our PCRs would not be able to detect them. So it would be less sensitive. And that could explain some false negative results when, in fact, someone still does have um, SARS-CoV-2. So it's important from that point of view. And finally, it's important because we use the genome sometimes now more recently to look at whether this could really be a distinct virus from the first episode. And so we do have to understand what's happening in the genome in order to be able to use that information to guide our understanding of reinfections. We also need to under, uh, understand the structural um, proteins to understand serological um, uh, tests. So the serology tests that currently are being used and that could be used in South Africa would be targeting the spike protein or the nuclear capsid. Um, and inside the spike protein, there's some in-house assays that might target the RBD protein. So the reason you need to just at least know about this in uh, broad concepts is that um, the sensitivities and specificities might differ. Um, and it may be important to keep it in mind depending on what serology test was used and when was it negative and when did it become positive. So the, genomic, the genome does change slowly. And we know that about SARS-CoV-2 at least um, accumulates two single letter mutations per month in its genome. And if that doesn't mean much to you, just to explain that about half, it changes about as half as much as influenza, about a quarter as, as much as HIV. 
So it's a, a slow changing RNA vaccine that has proofreading enzymes and other ways of potentially correcting fatal mistakes within its genome. And so any two SARS-CoV-2 viruses at the moment collected anywhere in the world would differ by, differ by 10 RNA letters um, out of the 29,000 um, base pairs that exist within the RNA genome. But I think it's still early days, and these are some of the parameters that are being used to understand the genome. And I think we'll understand this much more, um, more better in the future as we explore this um, virus more carefully. So I'm sure all of you know this. Um, this is the sort of diagnostic test that can be done in the pre-incubation period, so minus one and minus two week, then when symptoms start in week one to week six. And I just wanted to highlight again the two tests that we would be using, the PCR and culture, in order to investigate reinfection. So now I'm not thinking about making the diagnosis, but how can we look at this from a reinfection point of view? Here we have virus culture and isolation in the red going up and down quite quickly, and only PCR remains positive. Um, stool PCR and respiratory PCR in the pink, the blue, and in um, this yellow color. And the respiratory and stool PCR staying positive for longer, while the nasopharyngeal swab PCR may be coming down a bit sooner. However, you're not able to culture the virus, and we don't think these people that have the shedding of um, PCR positive remnants, um, that they're infectious or that they're important from a public health perspective. IgG and IgM increase after week one, but mostly we're saying that we think 14 days to 21 days is when you're going to see enough antibodies to, to be detected with some of our kits because you need a very sensitive um, serology kits to be able to take these early days where the antibodies are at so, such low levels. And there's also more recent data um, that has been published where IgA is also important. And the reason you have to start to grapple with it a little is because some of the serology tests that you'll be using will be pan um, immunoglobulin. They'll look at IgG, IgM, and IgA. Some will just look at IgG. And that might be important, especially when you look at the timing of when the specimen was taken if you're investigating a reinfection. And remember, if we're saying a reinfection is happening, it's almost like we're expecting this whole scenario to be repeated in the future at some time, be it in three months or in six months or a year later, this whole scenario of having infectious virus that is culturable, again, being available, getting um, increases in antibodies, um, even if there's memory um, cells and uh, memory increases, but you expect these scenarios to happen again for a reinfection. And so, a lot of data recently, um, and recently is just in this period of the pandemic, and um, we're saying that the antibodies, they, they, they go down quite quickly after diagnosis. And this is a more recent study from Iceland where they looked very carefully at using multiple serological tests to see if antibodies truly went down after infection. And you can see at the bottom, not too much detail, but there was IgM and IgG and different targets. And they show just how variable depending on what isotype you're looking for or what target, what um, protein this, they are, what the they're trying to detect antibodies to, your results will be different. And that's important to consider. But the one take home message is also from the top slide is that simply seroprevalence is on the, the antibodies, the blue dots here from those that had recovered continue um, to be positive at high teeters even after 125 days. So as more time passes and as tests improve and have greater sensitivity, we are understanding more. So a lot of the truisms of the antibodies seem to be going to um, decline so quickly after infection. I'm not too sure how much um, that is true. We need to monitor and look at this carefully and we need to look at the recent literature and see what new data are showing us. In addition, so that was the serology and how the antibodies may continue over a long period. Here's just looking at um, PCR positivity, and they looked at culture and subgenomic um, RNA in the study that was published um, in Emerging Infectious Diseases. And just in general, to show you, I think the red and the yellow dots show culture positive um, specimens, and they're very early on in days of illness, which reflects as what I've shown you before. Um, so they showed that they were 
lots of, um, of their specimens were culture positive so early on, but slowly you lose the ability to even show subgenomic DNA, um, RNA, which is just um, replicating RNA. In fact, as you go from 30 to 40 to 60 to 70 days, you're just getting PCR positive without any evidence of them being culturable virus um, in the, the nasopharynx or in fact being any replication. And I think I wanted to highlight this because you've got 70 days here and you'll see some of the reinfections that are being described are within this time period. So just keep in mind, these were individuals that were known to have one episode. They were, um, they were followed up over a period of time. And this is the data that are coming out to show us just how long people might be PCR positive after their acute infection. So reinfections, um, there's limited evidence of reinfection for SARS-CoV-2 is at early days. And at the, towards the end of the presentation, I'm just going to show you how early days, although lots of work is being done to look at that. MERS-CoV and SARS-CoV don't help us much. There's very little data about reinfection. They do show, however, that antibodies stay um, uh, available up to several years afterwards, but there's no evidence of reinfection. And I think maybe it's because the limited spread, it was very small, localized, short outbreaks, um, and they didn't look long and hard enough. What does help us are human coronaviruses, which are very common. People have been working on these for several, several years, in decades, in fact. And there are data from other human coronaviruses that um, reinfections do occur. And one of them, in fact, is an experimental infection in volunteers where they showed that um, reinfections could be initiated in these volunteers. So the reason why we have to worry about all of this and think about MERS, human coronaviruses, um, influenza, measles, is what do we know about reinfections and what are the aspects um, that we have to keep in mind. And it very much depends on pathogen because influenza, we know there are reinfections because it changes so much. We need to think about the host pathogen interactions, just how does the host um, respond to the infection? How is their immunity to this infection? Um, the immunity in the individual? And then um, whether these people are even exposed to the virus. So in times of the lockdown in Europe, when there was very little um, mingling of people, keeping to the social distancing rules, etc. There was little exposure to virus to allow for reinfections, which may explain some hiatus in your ability to observe reinfections. And this will be ongoing and going forward as maybe um, other um, recommend, recommended um, social distancing and prevention of exposure may result in less reinfections or if one is really in a society where there is going to be um, lots of infection, lots of transmission, you're going to see more reinfections. And then so are they clinically more severe or less severe? We know that there are data um, from other viruses and other um, pathogens that show that they could be less severe. And we may have this antibody dependent enhancement that may make these reinfections more severe. And you'll see there's a whole range in the descriptions of both human coronavirus reinfections, but also in those that are currently being described for SARS-CoV-2. And then just to bring back, um, the, the, the immunity, the serology results, and how we need to monitor and e explore that, as well as look at antigenic drift, because that makes it different for other pathogens, but how does that um, affect us for SARS-CoV-2 um, and the information that we might be gathering over time? This is just a slide from a, a, a World Health Organization um, trying to answer, do we know whether we have immunizing antibodies? Um, do we know if we are protected? And I guess that's where the reinfection question comes in. Um, if we have the infection, we should at least be able to, um, to sigh a sigh of relief and say now we're protected. But the data are really out there. We're not sure. Um, no one knows if we are protected once we've had the infection. Other viruses show that we should, other respiratory viruses, really, we should be um, protected at least for a period of time. The sequence change in influenza, we know that may make us more susceptible again, but that isn't happening with SARS-CoV-2. Um, there is evidence of reinfection with other um, coronaviruses, and that's the data that I'll show you, um, but not so much for um, MERS and SARS-CoV-1. SARS However, there the antibodies have been detected over several years. So it's really, everyone is scratching their heads. It's not just us, um, the international entities as well. 
um, and the, there are no clear answers, unfortunately, for tonight. But there are some data. So these are recent data. They were published um, or are uh, still ahead of print, 2020. They looked at New York City, um, 191 participants from 2016 to 2018, looking at respiratory viruses, specifically looking at coronaviruses for this paper. And they found 12 um, repeat infections in these um, participants over these uh, two to three years. And what they did show very nicely is for the two human coronaviruses, so OC43 and HQ, um, HKU1, they show just when do these reinfections occur. So if you look um, on the x-axis, you've got weeks from previous infection. And here on the y-axis, you've got probability of becoming reinfected with the same beta coronavirus, the one, um, these two that I've just mentioned. And you'll see that they differ slightly. Remember, I told you that these viruses are a little different. So again, here you see that the one is more likely to do it sooner. Um, and the other is more likely to do have more people we have reinfections. So OC43, in fact, up to 50% of individuals um, would be reinfected over a period up to 60 weeks after um, the, the primary infection. And this is useful because it's within a year that you start seeing this increase. So here you have 40 weeks, 52 would be a year. And here you're seeing this increase. And that's, in fact, the summary um, conclusion is that within a year, you're starting to see with the human coronaviruses, you're starting to see reinfections and it differed by the different types of human coronaviruses. So in another study, this is now um, older data where patients were followed up for 35 years. In fact, 10 participants were selected um, for this analysis. Um, they were followed up from 1985 to 2020. Um, and you can see how important this idea of reinfections and trying to find answers is as people are looking at their data um, and um, historical cohorts. And they showed for one individual here on the, the left-hand side. So again, not to look at too much of the details, they showed in this one individual the measles antibodies and then to each of the four human coronaviruses. They showed the antibodies over this year, this period of 1985, to 2020. And you'll see the fluctuations of the antibodies. If the TETA was a significant increase, they showed the number. So you can see where you would have said this is a significant increase of these antibodies to indicate a new infection. And in fact, they put a dot or an asterisk on top um, if there were symptoms, if the individual had complained of any symptomatology at that time. And so clear evidence in this individual, and then in the supplementary they show for the other nine um, individuals, very similar data, that clearly over these 35 years, they were reinfected by the same type of virus. And in fact, they also show for three other individuals here, neutralization, so that they were neutralizing antibodies. It wasn't antibodies that weren't able to um, neutralize the virus, but these were active antibodies that should have been able to do something. Um, and they show the change of neutralizing antibodies over time in these individuals um, in this cohort. So clearly, um, reinfection occurs. And um, most frequent reinfections was um, after 12 months. So they showed a, a span so that there was time that um, had to pass before there were reinfections. So all the data from the UK, they describe a prospective study. This is only in children and for two coronaviruses. Um, and they showed that human coronaviruses were common in this group. And they looked, um, I think they were sampling every four months um, and showed that these, uh, um, these infections um, occurred um, within or outside of those at about six monthly intervals. And they also showed that um, they, but they, what, one other thing that they showed in this cohort, which was also very interesting and another caveat to be careful in interpreting some of these data, is they, they showed consecutive acute infection, so um, ongoing shedding of the virus um, in, um, in these children. And they mentioned in their discussion that in fact that has been shown for other respiratory viruses, that adenoviruses, for example, can be carried for several months. So as one looks, more carefully one finds more scenarios and more differences and it does make the interpretation a bit more complex.
Um, this is an older study that was also published in 1986. So it's not a recent um, look at historical data. This was published in 1986. These are households. So within a group, you've got a household with the different household members and the mother and the father. These are the ages of the household members and whether they had antibodies to, the, again, um, OC43 and 229E. And you'll see that, so one is the circle and the other one is the triangle. If they had significant increases of antibodies to these viruses, they would be closed circles. And they showed, again, very nicely that there was a span you would have the one virus and within the closest period of the next time of four to six months you would get the other virus and you'd have to wait for about six eight to twelve months before you get an increase in the antibodies against the same virus so again showing that there was some immunity even if it was short-lived but that reinfections over this time period were different definitely possible and they showed that amongst all of these household members um, and you see that where there were antibody teachers that were not increased significantly, you had the clear circles and the clear triangles. Interestingly, they didn't, they looked specifically at symptoms that didn't show any difference in the severity of symptoms between the one primary infection or the uh, the reinfection. What they did show, interestingly enough, is that there were people within a household would have more severe symptoms. So maybe there's some genetic component that um, makes uh, um, the severity of illness um, more, more enhanced um, in individuals. So again, evidence from human coronavirus that um, reinfections occur. They showed that um, the antibodies rise from one season to the next was against another virus that recurrent rises to the same virus were always separated by at least eight months. Um, and so they feel that infection with one, one virus may convey short-term immunity to homologous reinfection. Um, and I think that makes sense. Um, and there's maybe some other data that bear that out. So now looking at SARS-CoV-2 reinfections. Um, so what do we know? So there's lots of information out there and in fact we've um, in the ministerial advisory group these papers and there are, three, there are four of these slides so about 24 papers that we could find and that's only what we could find um, in the rush um, of looking for them that describe variations on a theme of possible reinfections but we thought there were always alternative explanations that were more likely and most likely these were persistent shedding, persistent PCR positives but you'll see that in some of these papers, they mention reinfection. Some of them allow for the fact that persistence and sampling issues may have been important. Um, positive retests in COVID is how some of them describe it. Viral relapse, reinfection, inflammatory rebound. So if you start looking for reinfection or for COVID-19, you're going to find quite a lot. But many of these, in fact, at the moment, the experts don't think are true reinfections. Here's the next page, recurrences. Three cases of redetectable re positive SARS-CoV, and I think the terminology is going to become more and more complex. And hopefully, we will come to some standard terminology to describe all of this. Um, and then a successful recovery of a recurrence of a positive um, SARS-CoV-2 RNA. And I think a lot of this is to think of these as a laboratory test that was positive with or without symptoms and there's so much more that needs to be explored in order to really assess them as possible reinfections. And I think this is the third page of all of these. And here's the fourth page. So just to give you a feeling of people are out there, they're looking at this, they're trying to explore this. Um, and there's lots of talk about reinfections, but in fact, there are very few published cases of reinfection and I'll be going through this was the first one that in fact I think generally is accepted um, as a, a possible reinfection. It was a 33 year old man um, otherwise healthy and immunocompetent who had his first episode um, in March. He presented and was PCR positive on the 26th of March and had a three-day history so three days before had onset of symptoms. He was um, mildly symptomatic um, and was asked was hospitalized on the 29th uh, of March so really had cough sore throat fever and headache we wouldn't be admitting him but in Hong Kong that was their policy they admitted everyone who was positive so even though he was already asymptomatic on the 29th of March he was hospitalized and stayed in hospital for 
for two to three weeks. He was discharged on the 14th of April after being asymptomatic in hospital for this period and received two negative um, NPOP swabs to 24 hours apart. So this is part of their policies. We don't advocate that and I don't think looking for reinfections to change that at all. I don't think anyone needs to be re-swabbed to take them out of their 10-day isolation here in South Africa. On day 10, after symptom onset, he had one serum done and it was negative for IgG. And that's the reason why I try to highlight some of the issues. IgG comes up a bit later in infection. Day 10 is really early on in his infection. So it makes perfect sense that he might have been negative at that stage, but it doesn't mean it didn't mount an immune response. His second episode, he was asymptomatic. He was returning on a flight um, from um, a holiday in Spain, but he flew via UK. And it was part of the Hong Kong screening policy to screen him. So he was screened on a um, posterior oropharyngeal saliva specimen and had a positive um, PCR at a reasonably low CT value. So we talk about high CT values at about 35, 37, 38, 26 is, is, is a a good viral load, so there was there was virus there, quite a lot of it, um, and he showed a mildly eleva elevated CRP. So if you look on the right hand side at the figure, his CRP um, is in the dashed um, line here at about eight point um, six, and it goes down during his hospitalisation during the period, and this is days after hospitalisation. In the solid line, you see this, um, the CT value. And if you look carefully, the CT value is going up as you go down. And that's because as the CT value goes up, your viral load goes down. So they can see that it was steady for a few days. And then the virus viral load is going down. And that at least speaks to the coherence of these results. It doesn't add so much, but it definitely says that everything starts, is making sense. He did seroconvert. And again, it was only IgG that was looked for. They used um, both an in-house assay and an Abbott um, test, but they showed negative antibodies initially and then a positive antibody. And again, it's just important to understand the dynamics of um, uh, the antibody tests and um, the immune response to know that he may have had memory cells kicking in, doing everything that they needed to do and have antibodies IgM. It was just that the IgG was not detected in these early stages of his infection. So, he, um, what is of importance is to look at the time period between piece, the first episode and the second episode. It was 142 days, so four and a half months. And that's very useful to look at because as you look at a few more cases that are described of possible reinfections, you'll see that this varies quite a lot. But he had a solid four and a half months. I don't think we've seen shedding for that long. I think um, looking at his clinical history, and then finally looking at the viral genomes between the two specimens that um, they had. So they had the first episode um, specimen and they could do sequencing from that specimen and they showed that it was a clade five, clade V. And in fact, it's interesting that they, um, they show the other nomenclature that is used and I think I don't want to go into detail, but they show that it was different to the clade that um, genotyped in the second episode. So they're sh clearly, clearly showing that there are enough differences between the two genomes to put them into different clades. Um, and that is not insignificant. Some of the other reinfections, in fact, have um, specimens that are in the same clade and have just a few mutations. So I think um, the evidence related to this reinfection is quite strong. And in a, the one thing that might be lacking is proving to us that the specimens were definitely from this individual, looking at the first specimen and the second specimen and proving that. But I think if an audit trail had been done, and I'm sure it had been done, just to check that everything made sense and that there wasn't a specimen mix up, et cetera, um, all these results seem to make sense. And this is a convincing description of a reinfection in the current literature at the moment. So this is our Hong Kong case. So there's a Nevada case that I think is in press. I, th I think it hasn't been final. Um, the final proofs have not come out yet. This is interesting because if you'd go, this is a 25 year old male. So also healthy, um, apparently immunocompetent, um, no underlying conditions. But this reinfection is described, there's 48 days between the two episodes. So only one and a half months, and I've just been describing to you just how long 
human coronaviruses can be shed and how long SARS-CoV-2 has been shed. So this is definitely within the 70, 80, 90 days that people talk about. However, they feel quite strongly that they showed that the the, the strain, the genotype of from the episode one specimens versus the genotype of the specimen two um, um, specimens were so different. They don't tell us what specimens were collected, but they say that um, they showed a sequence type of clade 20C. So here you also see a clade 20C. Um, so the clade is the same, but the one argument that they do have, which is quite interesting, is that there were four single nucleotide variants in the first genotype that weren't in the second. So if there'd only been forward-going changes, that would make sense. So you lose things, you gain things. But to, um, to revert back and get those four single nucleotide variants in this strain is a bit unusual. And it's one of the arguments they make in the discussion that it's, it's further proof that they think that these were two different episodes. Um, he was symptomatic in both of them, um, also not severely ill, sore throat, cough, headache, nausea, and, um, diarrhea, um, and had symptom resolution with negative um, specimens between the two episodes. He presented again with fever, headache, dizziness, and interestingly enough, showed more of an ammonia, low respiratory tract infection, where a new patchy bilateral interstitial um, infiltrate was detected on his chest x-ray. Um, on the second episode. So clearly some evidence, um, whether it's absolutely convincing, um, I'm not so sure. And I think the, the new data and data as we learn more about this virus, and we also learn what this virus does in individuals over time, we will understand how to interpret the genomic um, analyses um, between these two episodes. But this is being published as a, and it's one of the sort of confirmed um, reinfections in the literature. These are becoming slightly less um, descriptive as because they've not been published. So there's one in ProMed, an Ecuadorian 46-year-old um, male, I think with no underlying comorbidities as described in the ProMed description. He had an episode um, where he was mildly symptomatic um, in the first episode, and then 81 days later, so two and a half months, again with potentially our 90-day um, cutoff of three months, um, but just off those 70 days that we know that we could be shedding if we look at other data. His episode, the second episode was clinically more severe and they say, but don't give us any more details that the sequencing of these two specimens um, demonstrated two different strains. But I think I didn't mention um, in the second case, in the Nevada cases, right at the bottom here, I, they have went to great lengths to prove that the two specimens came from the same individual and that there were no mix-ups. Um, and so I think that's something that needs to be considered at least theoretically, if not able to do it as solidly as they did, where they really looked at the genome of the individual, um, of, um, of the human cells that were in the two specimens and showed that they belonged to the same individual. Here we have none of those details. So again, I'm not too sure what to make of it. I think it's interesting and important for us to, in, to hear and learn of these reinfections, to see what are the common denominators, um, and for this to guide us as we go forward looking at reinfections in South Africa. And then phase four and counting, because I think as you look, you'll see that there are more and more reinfections being described. And in fact, very interestingly, in the Netherlands, as well as I think in Belgium, these are experts that um, work with human coronavirus. So not experts that have moved into SARS-CoV-2, but have worked with human coronaviruses, were in fact expecting this pandemic to some extent, um, had set things in place to really be able to do studies and investigate. And they say they're not surprised. Um, they think that human coronaviruses clearly shows reinfections. They don't think this is completely unexpected. Exactly to what extent this happens, they don't know. And what the Netherlands is doing is they, after describing this first immunocompromised individual who had reinfection, they went back to a cohort of their first um, diagnoses and are looking more actively and have found several more reinfections and are investigating them very carefully, looking at the genomes um, between the first and the second episode. Not They can't do it for all of the um, historical um, cases from the um, SARS-CoV-2 
um, epidemic in their country, but they can do it for some of them. And in fact, that's the biggest challenge that we're experiencing as we as infections are reported to us is that the specimens aren't available to investigate them as carefully as these previous descriptions have been able to do. Belgium, they describe this female who had a second um, infection, but also looking now more actively and hopefully in the next few weeks, both of these groups will be presenting data and publishing data that will tell us more about reinfections in cohorts of individuals that they've identified over the last three or four months. And this is um, not described very carefully at all, but just to show that there's ongoing cases being identified and being described um, throughout the world at the moment. So we need to think of guidelines going forward, just what do we do in South Africa? And one lesson I think looking at all of these descriptions is that we have to work very carefully to have very good laboratory data. We need to know about the PCR, the PCR tests, we need to get those specimens. So the laboratory component of an investigation into reinfection is very important, but so is the clinical and the epidemiological and looking at the serological data. So we need, really need to work with you. So the laboratories have to work with the clinicians to be able to do this quickly, to do it well, so that we can explore what might be happening in South Africa. And I don't think we need to do it just to, to be doing something in South Africa, but I think there's enough evidence that the epidemic has been quite different in South Africa and that we might have slightly different types of reinfection. And that it might be important for us still to do this in South Africa to see what is happening um, in our country. And there are some answers to questions um, on the NICD webpage. We tried some, and these were early on that we put this up, you'll see 11th of August. Um, I just rechecked, they're still there. They're becoming a slightly outdated, um, but we'll wait a little until a bit more information is available. And especially, I think we're waiting for the CDC. Um, they have very good answers also so, where they deal very constructively with a cutoff of time. I think they use 90 days and where they say before that you don't have to do too much, but public health action and notification in fact in the United States happens if you have a PCR positive after 90 days since your last um, PCR test. So it's very worthwhile to go and see, um, and these will be updated, which is why it doesn't help for me to describe them all in detail here now, because I think there will be updates and there will be some protocols as the CDC tries to investigate reinfections in the United States. And I think we can see how much we would like to align to those protocols going forward. We've been thinking about how to do a few things in South Africa, and we're using some of the CDC as well as in discussion with the experts here. A three month cutoff is quite a wholesome cutoff. Um, it makes sense. Yes, we wouldn't have picked up some of the reinfections that are described, but we would have picked up the, the more convincing ones. Um, what is important is I think we've left it open to as determined by the clinician. So if you do have a positive, a PCR positive or a readmission from a clinical perspective and it's worrying you, we will definitely investigate if the clinician thinks that it warrants further investigation. And just what investigations, I'll show you at the bottom, the things that we can do. After 90 days, we're saying, I think, go ahead, let's investigate. This is a bit unusual. Um, and then we also think that after 90 days, you need to in institute public health. So they have to go back into isolation. So before that, within 90 days, we're saying, just wear a mask, social distance, do everything that you're normally doing. We think that's enough, especially if you're, we're just picking up RNA and there's no culturable virus and you're not infectious. After 90 days, we're getting to a stage where we think we don't know enough. We don't know how much of this virus is culturable, is infectious. We need you to go back into quarantine. And yet this is not documented. I think we've got a few queries, but it's to really challenge you to think about it and see if you agree and people who don't agree to let us know, to give us other options of what we should be doing, but it's to have some answers to the many questions that we are asked. If you have one of these cases to get a verbal consent from them that we can investigate further, to let the NICD know, but also let any of the local expert labs know that can do things like um, sequencing and culturing. And there are more and more academic labs, quaternary labs and research laboratories that are able to do this. And we're very happy for those labs then to explore in their region with their partners and networks to look at reinfections and we'd be grateful for information to guide us um, if they find anything. So we say to keep in mind other pathogens, it's very important um, to consider other diagnoses and not just always think of SARS-CoV-2 because that's what's on top of our heads at the moment. 
discuss the clinical and epidemiological context in case there's any public health action that should be other than what is routine, in case there's a party, contact tracing that has to happen, other things that need to be dealt with. And then very importantly is to get the specimens. And that's the biggest challenge we have found is that the first specimen is often discarded because um, labs discard in batches after one or two or three weeks. We're trying to speak to laboratories not to discard their positive specimens, but in fact, that's the most urgent thing to do, either to tell us or your laboratory that you'll be working with so they can phone the lab or just phone the laboratories and tell them to hold on to all those specimens as we investigate. Ideally, we'd like both information about what tests were done, the CT values, the outputs, as well as the specimen. And then a way to explore this is to just look if we can confirm that there's not been any specimen mix up to confirm the PCR results. And then specifically and more importantly, is to look at culturing and sequencing. And the five to six reinfections that we've been looking at, in fact, there's no, there's no evidence theoretically of mix ups. The few that we've been able to retest, everything makes sense. The results are positive when the people say they're positive. So we don't think that there's many mistakes slipping through. We think these are real possibilities. It's just we don't have the ability to explore them further because we don't have the specimens from the original episode. And serology is also important to check whether serology was done. And as it becomes more available, I think that might be more likely, especially in the private sector, but also to submit to us and to other laboratories serum separated tubes um, to look at serology. So that's how we would try to investigate it further at the moment in South Africa. But just to tell you, that would be reinfections that are identified by you um, in just normal diagnostic work. There are research projects that are looking more carefully at cohorts, and this, these are household cohorts um, in two sites, a peri-urban and a rural site. In fact, here you can see cl close to Clarkstorp, um, the peri-urban in Agincourt is the rural site. And we're looking over time. So what we're doing, looking at these cohorts, family members in the households are being swabbed twice weekly with a PCR. So we're looking at them and every two months, those that are SARS-CoV positive will have a serology test and every six months, um, the rest of the cohort. So we're doing multiple different tests and it's done in a standardized fashion. And what's very interesting, we'll be looking at symptoms. So both symptomatic and asymptomatic people are swabbed. So some of all of those challenges that we are talking about, we wouldn't pick up the one in Hong Kong because we don't do swabbing for screening at airports and we shouldn't be doing it. Um, could we still look at those data? Yes, and I think this is just an example of a study that we're doing here at the NICD with partners at BITS and um, at the sites, but um, other studies are being done by other research groups. So hopefully data will become available in South Africa. And what we will hopefully have is, if you look, this is a, a mosaic, we call them mosaics. It's very similar to that household um, figure that I showed you earlier on the talk, you'll see the study participants, one participant is one row, the columns are a specimen, a block is a specimen, if it was negative it's grey, if it's positive we've shown here it's red for SARS-CoV-2 and if there was no result or no specimen taken it is a, um, a blank, it's white. And you'll see by following this cohort up over time, we'll have infections, we'll be able to see them becoming negative and then come positive. And all the specimens will still be available as well as the history about symptoms and exchange in, within the household. So we're hoping that the data will become available to help us understand reinfections in South Africa um, um, going forward. And I think I'd like to thank you for your patience and for your time. Um, and um, I'll stop sharing so that I can then we can discuss and help with the discussion. Over. Uh, thank you, Anne. Uh, uh, amazing talk. Um, and what's really nice is that there's still so much to learn. Um, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into it. There is a question from uh, Sarah Nager. It says, hi, Anne, have the current reported reinfection cases been symptomatic? Yes, they have been. Um, uh, and in fact, I'm not sure if all of them have been, but I think so, because I think there's very little sp specimen taking um, without symptoms at the moment. What is interesting that they, the, 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 the time between episode one and episode two is really at the three month cutoff, which might reflect that doctors um, only start retesting or taking swabs again at three months at 90 days at that interval. Um, so 
I'm not too sure if they were infections. We definitely can't prove them, but they were symptomatic and they differ, I think. Um, but they're mostly middle-aged individuals. We don't have any young um, people, very young people, um, like children, and we don't have very old people, elderly, uh, over 65 years of age, over. Okay, thanks. I don't know if you've seen the other questions. Any thoughts on potential of reinfection or extended viral shedding in dialysis patient? That comes from Siobhan Clark from National Renal Care. Reinfection in dialysis patients specifically. Yeah. No. yeah. And I'm not just sure if they would be more at risk. It's interesting. The reinfections um, are often healthy individuals of those described. Um, and whether you're right, I mean, that's why immunity is such an important aspect to it. Um, whether comorbidity makes people less likely to mount a good immune response, but the data aren't out there. And even for the human coronavirus reinfections, looking at the historical literature, et cetera, it doesn't seem to hone in on reinfections being specifically associated with um, immunocompromised individuals, Im individuals known not to mount such a good immune response. But at the moment, I don't think they would be at particular risk. I would investigate them and look at them um, if they are becoming symptomatic um, and we're going to have to learn going forward. Over. So, so it would be beneficial that Siobhan get in touch with you if she has any uh, renal dialysis patients that she feels have had either extended or reinfections because it's a nice cohort to look at as well. Absolutely. And I think clinicians, you can, uh, people can start looking at what research questions they specifically want for their patients because I think especially looking within the renal um, um, expert, the nephrologist group, whether there's an element and interest. And yes, we're very happy to discuss them. We may not be able to investigate all of them, but often just a discussion of looking at the data that is available um, makes it possible to say this is unlikely, this is likely. But I do think if any of you want to investigate cases in your specialities, is please to remember to tell the labs to keep their positive specimens. Um, I think that's the first message that should go out there because that would definitely assist in trying to um, investigate them further. Over. Thanks, Anne. Um, a question from uh, uh, Natasha uh, Nondula. She says, um, how many variants in a specimen per time is enough to say that there's reinfection? Uh, how much variation? We don't know. <laughs> and I think that's why there's, um, so how much variation between two genomes is enough to say that this must be a reinfection? I think the jury is out. I think there was enough difference to be convincing in the Hong Kong um, case because they were different clades. Um, but the, the, in the Nevada case, it was the same clade. And then they started getting that it was enough to have so many, it was only seven versus four changes, but they said the direction of the changes was also important. So I think the answer is we don't know. And if people want to say that this is truly a reinfection, I think, the onus is on us to prove in, in different, many different ways that this was unlikely to be just shedding and change of the virus in that individual. So intra-host um, mutations that occur um, as people carry the organism over time. Um, so I think that's the big challenge that we have. Um, over. Thanks, Anne. Um, are there any other questions? If you can type them, please. Uh, we've got 10 more minutes, or oh, I'm sure less than 10 minutes. We'd like to let you go five minutes early so you can hear dear fellow citizens talk from the president. And I think uh, that's pretty much it. I think they got the message and I really appreciate it. And anyone can contact you uh, should they have any other questions. Uh, Barkley has got a hand raised. Um, Chris, Matthew, can you unmute Barkley, please? Sure, give me two seconds, let me try. Chris's baby is cranky, so if you hear crying, please ignore it. Uh, <laughs> give me two seconds, Mandy, sorry. It's okay. okay. Barkley, give us two seconds, please. And sorry about this. No, don't worry. I'm fine. I'm here now. Barkley should be unmuted. Okay, Barkley, do you want to try? Yeah. Yes, can you hear me? You yes. can, yes. Yes. 
You know, um, it is our experience here in uh, north of Pretoria that uh, it looks like, uh, you know, the, the virus does not seem to have a rampant, uh, you know, causing patients who, who, who have, uh, you know, diabetes. Is it the same uh, perception that uh, other people are actually seeing, that patients with uh, diabetes seem, you know, to not to be so adversely affected compared to, you know, for instance, patients who are obese or uh, patients who are elderly over the age of 65? Is that uh, um, everybody's observation or is it just my illusion? <laughs> I think your clinicians might be able to help, but I think the data that we're looking at at the moment seems to imply that that may be the case. Obesity seems to be one of the biggest risk factors for severe outcomes or for prolonged uh, clinical courses. Um, just the variation, I think um, Cape Town definitely showed that there was an in risk, increased risk of death in diabetic patients um, and that it was less so in well-controlled diabetics and that's published. So there are published data from Cape Town that sh show that diabetes, but it is less so. They didn't look at obesity in that paper and are going to do that going forward. So I think the, the jury is still out. What is the most severe comorbidity? And as the number of infections go down, we have too few numbers to be able to look at it in great detail. Um, but there is some comor comorbidity data in the DATCOF, weekly DATCOF reports that shows that diabetes is definitely associated with maybe less so than other um, comorbid conditions. Over. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Is there anything else? Anyone else raised a hand? Anne, um, I think that's it for you tonight. Uh, I'd like to thank you again. Um, I think it, there's been, I'm sure you can see the comments on the side here about an excellent talk, a great talk, an interesting talk, and people are very grateful for the information you've given them. And uh, I'm sure that you'll start getting some referrals now that they know where to refer to. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, have a good evening every, oh, Prof Matara, you had a new message? No, no new message from Prof Matara. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, have a Thank good you. evening and uh, be careful because I think uh, people are also getting a bit wild out there. So be careful. Andy, sorry, just to add in, uh, and you did say at the beginning, but this will be our last talk for a while until we decide a new lecture series to launch. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm exhausted now after 28 <laughs> lectures. Anne, you were, the, you were the esteemed last one in the series. Thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you for the it. opportunity. Thanks all. Okay. Goodbye. Pleasure. Bye-bye.